an Emmy Award winning actor, author, director, musical performer, and an officially certified astronaut. Please welcome to our favorite guests, Mr. William Shatner. Hello, So, uh, here we go. <laughs> uh, it's always, you know, like, like how do you begin? Uh, sometimes I'll, I'll have uh, an experience in the city that I'm in. And I've been to Richmond before, but I, I don't quite remember. So what you do is you've got this wonderful makeup on, and you look great. You're the blue person. What do you call them? The, yeah. <laughs> Ask how old are you? Do you know the right here? Fifteen. No, no, you've been closer. Fifteen. You're fifteen. What do you want to ask me? What's the worst thing you ever had to film? What's the what? Worst Star Trek thing you had to film. What's the worst Star Trek thing I had to film? <laughs> well. It's a choice between kissing a beautiful girl or hitting a bad guy. And I think kissing the beautiful girl was probably. Uh, the worst thing, well, there were so many things that went wrong. What's your name? Maggie. Why do you want to know what the worst thing is? <laughs> no, right into the microphone. Because, like, it always seems like... No, no, right into the microphone and tell me why you want to know the worst thing that ever happened. Because all this seems to go right at the end of the episode, so I wonder if it ever went wrong behind the scenes. What did you say? <laughs> did anybody, did anybody else have difficulty understanding? Yeah, okay. Stop, stop. I know you're excited. And I'm excited to see you too. Beautiful baby. So slow it all down. Because at the end of the episode, they always solve the problem. So they get everything wrong behind the scenes. Oh, I got it now. That's beautiful. Everything's always so nice and bright at the end. What could go wrong? Well, I'll tell you what would go wrong. Everything would go wrong eventually. Like those doors that open, you know, as you approach. You know how they did that? There was a guy behind the door. Looking out, like, no, oh, here he comes, and opens the door. Well, occasionally that guy would fall asleep. <laughs> and I'd come to the door, and <coughs> I'd get the door. Or sometimes the door would open with my back to camera, I'd go, <laughs> and the door would close, and I'd go, <laughs> And what else would go wrong? There was a guy, there was a bad guy. Film is two dimensions, right? There's width and, and height, but there's no depth. Now you understand what I just said? Say it into the cat, into the... Yes. I understood every word you said there. So... Uh, so when you have a fight, a, a, a staged film fight, you can, you can, if this is the guy, you can punch as far away as 6, 8, 12 inches because it's flat. So if this guy goes like that and reacts, and I've done as far as this, you don't have to come anywhere near. Well, there was a particularly bad guy who played a lot of bad guys. But he was really a bad guy. I mean, I mean he was, he'd been arrested, and, you know, and I was, I was supposed to have a fight with him. I'm trying to remember his name. And I came very close to his nose when I went to touch him. I came very close to his nose. I kind of brushed his nose twice. And the third time he said, 
If you do that again, I'll kill you. I didn't do it a third time. That's how things go wrong. You good with that? Okay. Hi, down there. How are you? Can you make everything out there? Okay, there, there's some sheets. Oh, that's better. Okay, next question. Uh, Mr. Shatner, what about That's my name. Uh, well, now that we again. Oh, my goodness. Uh, everyone knows you deservedly so for your amazing. Everybody idea. knows me deservedly so? <laughs> yes, for sure. Do they deserve to know me or I deserve to know them? <laughs> They deserve to know you. Oh, okay. okay. Um, I wanted to ask you, you were so well known as an actor, a singer, a writer, but you're a great interviewer, and I'm a big fan of Raw Nerd, that show of yours. That was Aren't you the sweetest? I, I love you. What's your name? <laughs> My name is Adam. Adam, you're, you're touching on a really live nerve. And I'll tell you what, I'm going to finish your question because I've interrupted you, and that's a habit of mine. Well, I was just curious, I mean, to interview someone, it's kind of the reverse process of acting where you inter interrogate yourself, now you're interviewing someone else. That's very wise. Why. What attracted you to interviewing people because you're so good at it? And well, you know, I don't know that I'm good at it, but I've been told by people uh, who said the exact same thing, and so I think, why am I, why do they think I'm good at it? And, and I think it's because I have a curiosity about it, faith, especially about people. And I've come to realize that everybody, no matter how innocuous or how grand that person might be, they have a story. And frequently, that story has never been told, that story inside them. And secretly, whether it's known to themselves or not, they want to tell it. And I want to hear it. So I'm after the, the inner story of people I interview. And frequently, the people I interview who are accustomed to being interviewed, they'll say, oh my gosh, that was fun, or I didn't know I was going to do that. Just yesterday, yesterday, I did um, Paul, uh, what's Paul's last name? You know, uh, the character, uh, did the wine show, did that wine thing. And, what, Giamatti, Paul Giamatti, wonderful actor, yes, we all know him. Paul Giamatti is doing a uh, project along with a philosopher. So they wanted to interview me, and I'd never met Paul Giamatti, but I've admired him all these years as a wonderful actor. And I would indiscriminately do interviews, but I'd rather take the talk to Paul Giamatti. So he's doing a podcast with a philosopher. Uh, that's a really weird arrangement. Two guys, one an actor, and the other guy a renowned philosopher. What kind of a what kind of a podcast? What do they want to ask me? What does a philosopher want to ask me? Like the meaning of life? I'll tell them the meaning of life. We don't know. <laughs> How wise is that? Right? So I agreed to be on the show. So yesterday I was on the show. I don't do this deliberately, but when I'm being interviewed, I'll frequently be interviewing the interview. Like, well, what do you mean by that? And they get involved in what they mean by that, and we're talking about him, which is fine with me. So, there's this philosopher and Paul Giamatti, and we start on this, supposed to be like a half hour, it goes an hour, we're laughing, we're, we're, we're crazed in pursuing whatever the subjects were, which were humorous, most of them of my choosing, and they didn't get around to asking me the questions they wanted to ask me. So this morning I received a communication, can we do another podcast? Or we interview you. <laughs> so.
So I have discovered that this truth of everybody having their story, and it's enormously interesting because they've, they've lived it, they've hidden it, they, they don't even know it themselves. I'm trying to think of, of, a, of, a, of, a, of a good example. I did an interview of, uh, I think his name is Mitchell, of a Nobel Prize winning uh, winner of uh, 2022 uh, in chemistry. And, and so I now I've forgotten his personal story, but I'm really imbued, I'm really torn with the concept of global warming. I really think, I believe that global warming is upon us and it's an existential uh, 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 problem. By that I mean, it's a question of whether mankind is going to exist or not. That's how deep and personal I feel. So I said, absolutely, absolutely, I'm delighted that you applaud that because it's absolutely true. The, the things we're doing to Earth are so profoundly bad that we've got to do something. I've been a year away from a moment from Mitchell. I've been writing songs and performing songs. I've got an album out there called Bill right now on Spotify, but I did, I did a performance. Little little girl, what what are you applauding for? Come here. And I, I need you to turn around so we can see how cute you are. Okay, so <laughs> she's living every moment. Of, so what's your name? Solana. Solana. So, Solana. So Solana, you applauded the remark. She's got beautiful eyes. Oh my God. You're, you're, you're a beauty. Did you know that? Thank you. So you were applauding the, when I was talking about global warming. What were you, what, why were you applauding? I was applauding because you had an album on Spotify. <laughs> oh. Oh. Oh, <laughs> oh my God! Hit the little treasures as you go by. I thought you were just well, I'm so afraid of global work. No, you got an album on Spotify. I'm going to have another album. It'll probably be on Spotify in a while, uh, and I'm not sure what we're going to call it. But London Symphony Orchestra. I'm sure one of your favorites. Uh, it's going to be the, uh, the, the label on it. Um, so now I've totally forgot what I, 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 I'm going to knit this all together, I promise. I'm going to come back to Mitchell, but I'm on to the song that I wrote, which, with, with uh, a gentleman name of Robert Sherdog, Sherdog, um, called So Fragile, So Blue, and it's about this experience I had going up into space. And, and, and I could see, I could see the world. I could see the earth. This little blue dot that it's been referred to. I saw it. I saw the curvature of the earth. I saw the white clouds and the, and the, and the blue air and the, and the beige of the desert. I saw it. I saw it. I was up in space. And I got into weightlessness. There aren't, there aren't words for weightlessness. You know why? Because 600 people, but only 600 people, have been weightless. They, we can't describe weightless because we've never had it before. 10,000 years ago, the word horse came into the language. And we now know that 10,000 years ago, the horse started to be domesticated. So there are things happening that the humans invent a word for. Oh, that's wiggy-shabba-baba. 
Kau tahu dia udah dipungi sama bapak Dan dikam seumur dengan kuyusnya There are no words specific to wake us Because nobody's been to wake us Except me So I'll get back to that, I'm sure You good so far? Okay So Mitchell <laughs> I say to Mitchell, Nobel Prize winning Kevin, why? When I say Manhattan Project, you know what I mean when I say the Manhattan Project? Most of you know. Little, little girl, what's your name? Shalom, you don't know what I mean by Manhattan Project, do you? No, you weren't born yet. Uh, a long time ago. Long before you were born, America and their allies had to defend themselves by making a big bump and making the enemy know that you gotta stop. Stop killing us by having a big bomb. It's called the atomic bomb. So America brought all the scientists together during that war and and made a project to make this bomb quickly. And they call it the Manhattan Project. Okay? So when you hear the words Manhattan Project, it means you gotta do something now because it's imperative. I said to the Mitchell, why isn't there a Manhattan Project by all the scientists of the world getting together to take carbon dioxide and, and, and methane out of the air? And he said, we all. Scientists all over the world are gathering together to try and stop global warming, to take carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide is a gas which hurts us, but it also can be collected. It also can be collected. It's okay. Carbon dioxide. There's a company in Norway that is taking carbon dioxide, a gas, making a, 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 a solid and bury it in the earth. But it's only little bits. We need a gigantic project to take the poisons out of the air, out of the water, and out of the earth. And we've got to do it quickly. God bless you. God bless you. My dear, what's your name? Cat. Cat? Cat. Wow, is that short for H-Y? No, short for Katrina. For what? For Katrina. 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 What's your question, Katrina? Now, now that you've answered my question, what is your question? Uh, my question is, last year you told us about a prank that I believe you don't want to be more cool, um, where you were trying to Convinced to force Kelly that he was losing his mind by stealing his bagel out of the Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. I told that story then? You did, yeah. yeah. I was wondering if you had any more pranks that you guys pulled that you could tell us about. Pranks yes, that I pulled on um, my fellow actors. <laughs> Things that make me hate me. <laughs> yes, frequently. <laughs> well, there's a story I tell. I've told it. Quite a bit, so I don't want to repeat myself. But did I tell you about the bicycle and and Leonard Nimoy and myself? I had an episode with Leonard Nimoy and his bike. And I'm going to tell you the story. Okay. Don't tell me. <laughs> so, when we were shooting Star Trek, we were stage, whatever, 28 and 29. 28 and 29 was about a half a mile from the cafeteria. So it took 10, 15 minutes to get to the cafeteria for lunch. And then 10 or 15 minutes the other way. And we would have about 45 minutes for lunch. So, and then you had to stand in line. And there were 100 people all standing in line. That took another minute. So, 
you, you couldn't get lunch. Unless you were hurry. Unless you were first in line. And I used to do track when I was going to school. And I got pretty fast. So when the director would say lunch, even before he could say lunch, when he got to love, he would say love, and I'd be out the door ready to the cabinet. I was first in line. I ate lunch. Leonard, with his long legs, with his skinny chest, he would be last. And he'd say, how did you get lunch? And I said, I am fast. And one day he brought a bike to the set. And the first assistant said, Ugh. and he was on his bike and he went down and he got to the cafeteria first. So the next day, I brought a chain in the lock. <laughs> and I chained the bike to a fire hydrant. And I'm out the door, Leonard runs out the door, and his bike's not going anywhere. So the day after that, he brought these wire cutters. And he cut the chain. And he was first in line for lunch. So the following day, because there were rumors of people stealing bikes, I took his bike and I put it in for safety in my dressing room. <laughs> and as I was running out the door for love, I said to Leonard, your bike is in my dressing room. And then he ran down. So he ran to my dressing room. Oh, God, but I forgot to tell him. Was my Dobermans were in the dressing room. And when he opened the door, he said to you, the following day, to give him the final lesson, I hung this bike way up in the ceiling. And I had the lighting guys put spotlights on. And they said, lunch, they turned the lights on. And I said, Leonard, turn your eyes to the sky. <laughs> and he saw his bike hanging him. He gave up! He didn't talk to me for three days. And then I need him for lunch for those three days. Yes? You good with that? Yeah. We've got a beautiful lady in red. Hi, I'm Judy. Judy? Hi, I'm Bill. Judy. Nice to meet you. I'm nice to meet you. I'd like to know, over the course of your career, what changes you've seen in the entertainment industry that you think are good, and which ones are not so good? Huh. What changes I've seen in, uh, in show business that are good and not good? Well, I don't know. I'm going to make a statement that I don't know that I fully believe it, but since you're here, I don't know whether change at any time is bad. I think change, the, the universe, the world, and us are in a constant state of flux. We're all, things are always changing. The leaves turn, the trees grow, our toenails get long, we get old, we die, uh, uh, water uh, goes in different directions, and, Everything that is, the, the stars are churning and becoming more or less active. Uh, there's a word for it, uh, for change. What's the scientific word? Uh, entropy. 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 Entropy is a fact of the universe. Everything is changing. So we have to. Again, a statement I don't know whether I can totally believe. We have to go along with change. We can't fight change itself. We can maybe adjust, like 
and go a little to the right and go a little to the left. But I think change is inevitable. And it's up to us humans to be flexible enough to accept that change. I was on a set. This must be of interest to you. I was doing... <clears throat> I was doing an interview for the son of... of, uh, of uh, uh, Gene Roddenberry. Gene Roddenberry has a son named Rod. So Rod, I guess his name's Rod Roddenberry. <laughs> spare the Rod, and the spare, spare the Rod. And there's something there, but I won't go into it. Um, so young Roddenberry, youngish Roddenberry, is doing a show of some kind, and he wanted to interview me. And I agreed to the interview, and they took me down to a special stage in downtown Los Angeles. Yesterday, the day before yesterday. So it's like twice the size of this stage and deeper. And the back was curved. And the back was the set of the Star Trek Enterprise, was the control room. So I'm looking at the control room, and there are the banister, the desks, and all the equipment, and it's all, it's all there. And it's all projected. It's not there. I'm sitting from here to that wall, and I'm looking at it, and they say, that's all projected. It's all, is that banister? You know, the, the railing? The, the, the railing? The railing is projected. Everything was, it's called, used to be called green screen because they would project on a screen. This now is pixels, millions of pixels. This whole stage that they've got is all pixels. And each pixel, I guess you know what a pixel is because they're our phone. They're little, those little tiny electronic things that illuminate. Well, each one of those pixels has a wire. So every one, there are millions, millions of wires extending from these pixels. And especially this screen is one of a kind, has millions of pixels with millions of wires going to a, a uh, control room. That, that screen will project any of the software that's entered into it. So the software they put in was that of the of the control room of the Enterprise, but they could put anything in there. In fact, I do a show called uh, The Unexplained. Okay. And projected on screens, nothing like that, big screens, but not like that, are moving pictures of weird things that I'm talking about. Like, I talked about a Egyptian mummy. Not M-O-M-A-Y. M-U. An Egyptian, 3,000 year old Egyptian mummy that they had excavated. And it was incredibly preserved which is like something the Egyptians did and we can't do. And they put air through the vocal cords of this monk, who I think they said was a monk of their whatever religion uh, was being practiced. They put air through the vocal cords and the vocal cords made a sound of a 3,000 year old dead person. I mean, is that weird? <laughs> that qualifies as unexplained, right? Yeah, that qualifies as weird. Where am I going with that? I was so I was saying how change, how just the set is different, how. Uh, that minus one is the set I work on for the unexplained. 
the set we worked on in Star Trek was handcrafted. That banister, that banister had a curve to it that had a mathematical curve. It wasn't just a curve, it was like a curve that increased, like, I think, like a fractal. You know what I mean when I say a fractal? Neither am I, so I don't know what it means either. I was hoping you didn't know what it meant, so I wouldn't have to explain it. Fractal is like a mathematical equation, and it can be used like clouds. Clouds are fractals, uneven uh, borders. So that banister is made very carefully. They replicated it. In, in nothing. It's air. You're looking at it, and it's a banister that is the, the lights of the same banister, but it doesn't exist. What does that hold for our future? When something, I, with my eye accustomed to that set, I'm looking at the set, and I can't tell the difference between the reality and the projection. Now that's shame, isn't it? How do we adjust to that? Is all our is all our communication going to be electronic? Will we never at some point meet people face to face? But we're on a screen. We're on a pixelated screen. Hi, George. Hi, Dick. Hi. And you're having face to face conversation, and you never see anybody. Is that our future? That qualifies as a hope not, doesn't it? <laughs> so I would avoid those things. In show business, I would prefer face-to-face -face reality sets. I would try and avoid that kind of thing. Thank you. <laughs> you know, I did a very dangerous uh, uh, gag, a very dangerous, uh, uh, it, it's okay, sir. Are we okay? No, no, it's okay. I have a um, I did a very dangerous stunt um, uh, years ago. There, uh, I was playing a bad guy, and I was trying to escape, and I'm on the top of a train. And I'm running uh, along the train to escape the good guys. And along comes my helicopter, and I grab the helicopter, and the helicopter whisks me off to safety. So I said to the director, how do we do that? And he said, well, we got stuck. So they, practice with the train going 40 miles an hour along the rail and the stuntman running along the train but 40 miles an hour he was bent over like this running and the air was coming up like this it was in like a, a wing like an airfoil and it lifted him off his feet so he's running and he's barely touching the ground barely touching the top of the train but I said, how do you get a close-up to that? He said, well, I don't know. Maybe in the studio, we go back to the studio. I said, well, maybe I can try it. But if it doesn't go 40 miles an hour, maybe if it goes 10 miles an hour. He said, that's a good idea. So I got on top of the train, and, and the, the cameras were on a car, and I'm running along at 10 miles an hour, the car is following me. And I, I do it. The helicopter comes. I put the helicopter hand up. Get the helicopter. And we come. And I said to the director, "How did that look?" And he said, "Well, it looks like you're going 10 miles an hour." <laughs> so I said, "Well, what about 20 miles an hour?" He said, "Well, that might work." So the engineer in the train goes, "20 miles an hour," and I'm running along. And the air is just beginning to get a little tricky. And I got up and I said, well, how is that? He said, well, looks like you're running 20 miles an hour. I said, okay, here's, here's what I'll do. Let's go 40 miles an hour. And, and let's see what happens. 
I don't know why. And not only that, a lot of dangerous stuff, the actors are cabled off. So you're wearing a harness and they put on cable you somewhere. So if you fall, you go the length of the cable and you don't get hurt. There was no place to cable me off on the train. So now I'm running along 40 miles an hour, barely able to touch the thing, overhead bridge, helicopter, and finally I do the and how was it? Oh, that was great, you know, you know, and it worked. And looking back on it now, I think, I'm stupid. I wouldn't be here today to see you in Richmond if I had come off that train. What an idiotic. Macho! Macho! That's what I was doing. I was doing macho. Today, they can project all that. They can be... That's a computer image. So, these actors who say, yeah, I do my own tricks, you 